European football is back and the Champions League group stages started last night. I am here at Parkhead and I'm going to be meeting up with everybody's favourite Celtic YouTuber, Ryan Fitzsimons. You may know him as Ryan118. I am going to link his channel in the description box below. So yeah, Celtic have completed one of their six games already. Away to final. Two red cards, two goals conceded and a loss. No points. They will also have to face Lazio and Atletico Madrid. Yeah, it was a disappointing start last night for Celtic. Look at this. That star up there obviously signifies the fact that they've won the European Cup, the competition that they played in yesterday. This is a stadium and as a club which deserves top level European football and talent here. But let's speak to Ryan and see what he thinks about last night and Celtic's chances in the Champions League. European football started again last night for Celtic. Just how big is European football for you as a fan of this club? Oh, it's massive. It's, it's probably the most uh, exciting time of the year. I mean, I know we get a lot of kicks out of the derby games and we love our trebles and our trophies, but the European football brings something different. Um, the atmosphere that it brings to Celtic Park, the opposition that you get to face, it's something different. Um, despite how it's went in recent years, as a Celtic fan, you always like to go in optimistic. Um, and that's the exact same way I've approached it this year as well. So I'm excited. It's good to be back in the Champions League and, and long may it continue. <laughs> and so we'll speak about the game um, in a minute. We'll, we'll touch on that and we'll go into a bit more detail of it. Um, but how special was it playing Feyenoord in the first game, given the history with the two clubs? Yeah, it was, it's, I mean, I, I never realised up until I started doing my own research for the video that it was the first time we'd played them competitively since that final back in 1970. I, I didn't realise that was the only ever time we'd played them. So that was obviously a big factor in it, uh, looking for some revenge, you can say. Yeah. But uh, of course, the links with the likes of Wim Janssen, Henrik Larsson, Pierre Van Hooydonk, it's, it's two clubs with great histories. Um, and it's, it's a good change. Um, you've seen last night the Cup, it's one of the, the best stadiums in, in Europe. I, I love it personally. Um, so I, it, was a, it was a good draw to get. Uh, tough side, Dutch champions, obviously, but um, exciting football, just like, just like Celtic. And the rest of the group as well then, final, they're obviously tough, like you say, champions of the Netherlands. I think they've got the highest goal difference so far yeah. this season in their league Scored as well. 17 in the last three. Which is absolutely mad, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't know how good the opposition were that they were playing, but still, that's yep. a great start to the season for them. You've also got Lazio and Atletico Madrid. What were your initial thoughts on the group? Um, my initial thoughts were, this is much nicer than what we've been handed in recent years. Um, obviously, if you go back to Rogers' first tenure in charge, we had PSG, we had Barcelona, Man City, Bayern Munich, you know, we managed to avoid the, the big hitters. Lazio is a team who we, we managed to beat twice, uh, only four years ago. So I, I like to group on paper. Um, obviously, the Champions League, it sounds really stereotypical when you say it, uh, but you know, it's, every team is a tough game. Uh, there's no easy games in the Champions League, but it's a much nicer group than what we could have got. So it's one that I think that every Celtic fan rightly uh, fancy their chances in. And it, on paper, like you say, maybe, I know, again, they're all tough games. Mm -hmm. It did look more winnable than some of the groups, oh, like you say, that you've had down yep. the years. Would you rather, though, have a glamour tie? Like last season, even last season, I think mm -hmm. Leipzig and Shakhtar at home are yep. winnable games for Celtic. Maybe not Real Madrid home and away, but would you rather get just one glamour team in there? I know Atletico, they're a big side. <laughs> You just want the easy teams, yeah. Yeah, I, if anybody that watches my channel regularly uh, is, is watching the video, they will know my, my views on it. I, I hate the clamour ties. I'd rather avoid them. Give me the easiest, the best yeah. chance of getting through to the latter stages of any competition. It's always great, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, watching, I've seen Lionel Messi play here. I've seen some really good players over the years, but... I'd rather get the games that mean Celtic have more a chance of winning. Yeah. Um, and even though that comes back to smack you in the face sometimes, it's the, the on paper side of it that, yeah. <laughs> that counts. So, on grass that matters. Aye, yeah. exactly. So, uh, you know what, uh, like, it's nice sometimes to have the big teams, um, but listen, Atletico, Lazio and Feyenoord are the three big teams in their own right, so yep. I, I'm happy with that. The game last night. <laughs> Tell me about it. Ah, um, typical Celtic, that's the first words that come to your mind. Um, it's really disappointing and a lot of fans are, are, are really, really annoyed and I get it, it's frustrating. I'm trying the day later to look at it kind of level-headed and saying, listen, we went into a game against the Dutch champions, I didn't put expectation on Celtic to, to go and win the game, but when you look at the ma manner of how Celtic throw these games away, year after year when we are going toe-to-toe -to -toe with these sides it starts to get really annoying and that's basically again what happened last night we were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Feyenoord I think that up until they scored their first goal there was every chance of Celtic leaving mm -hmm. Holland potentially with a win and then you give away a, a silly free kick which leads to a silly goal 
you get two men sent off. There's not a better way to summarise Celtic in Europe. It was almost a carbon copy to some of the games that I saw here. I didn't come to any of them, but I watched mm. quite a few of them. The Real Madrid game, for example, you yeah. started off really well, first uh -huh. 30 minutes, and you end up losing. Yeah. It was similar last night. Do you think there's like a mentality problem within the squad? Yeah, I think, that, I think there might be. And I think it, it transcends teams, it transcends managers. It's, it's like a Celtic thing at this point. But it, see, for the opposition, it, it seems to be really easy for these teams to realise all they have to do is wait it out because Celtic are going to make a mistake so it's something that we need to eradicate from our game because if we don't we're going to keep doing it and, and opposition sides that know that we're going to keep doing it so it, it kind of works both ways you're coming up against a good team but if you capitulate you give them opportunities then you make it easier for them on the night and there was a couple of mistakes I think from the officials that you could maybe point out I, I'm not sure about the penalty the red oh, card or the first red card and you were telling me and again it's like a few decisions and you've still got to yeah. play better on the night, uh, but like the wall and stuff, uh, there's like somebody they, they in the wall. Like a metre away from the wall, yeah, they've got a player in the wall. And so one or two other decisions yeah. going your way, it could have been a different match, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, I, I never like to make excuses, I never like to blame referees. At the end of the day, we lost the game and we were the masters of our own downfall. There's, there's no point in shifting blame onto officials, but yeah, it's one of those ones as well. If, if maybe it's a different ref on the night, once again, things could, uh, things could be different, but Listen, there's, there's, there's not really any point. I think that one way or another, we'd end up making the same mistakes and yeah. we'd have still lost the game. And could you point, maybe blame at Joe Hart for the goal yeah, from the free I kick I as well? Think, you know, there's a shared responsibility there. He saves that penalty, but he lets that yeah, free and, kick and it's weird, and yeah. That sums up Celtic. You know, you save a penalty and Joe Hart finally saves a penalty. A massive European game and it comes when you're down to 10 men. Mm -hmm. You're down 1 0 to a stupid goal. It, it sums up Celtic, but aye, um, it's just really annoying. So the squad as it is right now, which players are, would you say, Champions League quality? There's a fair few, definitely. Um, obviously, a lot of people have criticised the, the transfer recruitment in terms of the, the guys we're bringing in, if they're Champions League quality. But we know for a fact we've got plenty of players who are, who are good enough. You look at Kyogo, who's probably our best striker since Henrik Larsson. Matt O'Reilly, who's attracted a lot of interest. Rio Hitati, attracted a lot of interest. Cameron Carter-Vickers, um, Alistair Johnson, who was fantastic at the World Cup. There's, there's, there are just a few names of players who are definitely good enough for this level. I think the big problem is, are we signing enough players to, to join them um, and, and challenging? Are we signing experienced players? And you were telling me something interesting yeah. earlier about Chris Sutton and Edward. Yeah. The whole transfer fee, fee thing. If you could just explain that, and do you think that ties into how you do in Europe? Well, to explain very briefly, Chris Sutton was our most expensive signing from the year 2000 right up until we signed Odson Edward in 2019. So that's what 19 years it took us to, to break a six million fee transfer record. Um, a lot of people very annoyed this summer that we didn't break that record. I think a lot of people had their expectations that Brendan Rodgers was going to come back and get a massive amount of money to spend and we were going to see some 10, 15 million pound marquee signings. Um, and because football's know, changed as yeah, well. The, the inflation in football is insane. Yeah, it's completely different. Um, and it is frustrating, I get it. People are annoyed that we haven't spent 10, 15 million pounds on a player. The transfer model of Celtic sadly doesn't allow us to do that. If it was up to me, if I was in charge, maybe that would change, but it's not me, it's, it's the guys at the top, Peter Lawwell, Dermot Desmond, and the recruitment side of, of things. Um, and, and we didn't spend 10, 15 million pounds on a player. So we are signing a lot of these project players, as people like to call them, whether or not they're the reason uh, we're holding ourselves back in Europe is, is for the fans to decide. Um, but you could say that plays a big part of it. The whole project thing and making money on players, I totally understand why teams do it. Yep. But I feel like that should be a stepping stone to the next stage of yeah. a football club. Do you think those thoughts are in the minds of the people in the board here to make that money and in two, three, four, five, ten years time they're actually going to start investing big money like you see in other leagues around Europe? I, that's the thing, I don't, with the current guys that are running Celtic, I don't know if that's ever going to be the aim to spend big. I think that they're more than happy to keep doing this year after year as long as we are putting out, I mean if you've seen the financial statement that Celtic published the other day, we're, we're making record profits. Hopefully, hopefully they realise over the next two years. Brendan Rodgers when he came in his first press conference, he promised he wanted success in Europe, he wanted to take us further and that was the big thing about coming here. If we want to do that then the board need to realise they need to back him with big money signings. You were quite happy when Rogers got announced. Aye. We yeah. spoke about the squad. Are you happy that he's a level of manager you'd want in the Champions League? Yeah, I mean, listen, on paper, there wasn't many better options than, than Brendan Rodgers. I know that he's still a divisive figure. There's still some people who are yet to be won over. Like, I completely understand that. Not everybody can be in the same mindset about it. Luckily enough, uh, 
I kind of forgave him very quickly and I was happy to see him back but I understand that some people don't find it as easy um, but for me, listen, you're talking about a guy who's went to a semi-final of a European competition he's won trophies uh, at the highest level he's won trebles at Celtic there wasn't many better uh, guys to appoint for the job I know yep. that people were talking about and we had a wee conversation about guys like uh, Knutson and um, obviously Jesse Marsh, guys like that as well but Rodgers for me is just so so clear of them so and there's a lot of like ifs buts and maybes in this last qu in this like next question and how long's a piece of string kind of a thing <laughs> but do you think Celtic would have done better in the Champions League this year if Andrew would have stayed compared to Rodgers coming in because Rodgers is yeah. more experienced in Europe uh -huh. yeah Andrew had a third year and look how well he's doing at Spurs yeah. like it's a tough one because um, it's obviously very you know depending on who you draw and who you there's a lot of as you said if buts and maybes to it I think that um, it's very easy to jump in quickly and say aye, we would have done better because Ange plays such such good football and uh, last year he, he entertained us but ultimately last night, I think for the first 45 minutes, Rodgers showed that he's still a manager that can do what Ange done and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with his side and also Brendan Rodgers has had uh, two campaigns better than, than Ange had last season so it's come match day six, I think that'll be the, the time where you can sit down and say, would have Ange, would Ange have done better? But who knows, by in the next two months, we could be sitting here with six points in Celtic Park. You never know. So it's, it's tough to predict right now. And that was going to be my last question, yeah. actually, is where do you predict Celtic to finish? Uh, probably bottom. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, I hope we can challenge for at least that third place. Top two would be tough. Dutch champions, Lazio, who, I don't know if you caught it last night, goalkeeper yeah, scoring, saw, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, good side, they finished second in Serie A. Atletico, who have just been consistently solid team under Simeone. Um, well organised team, well organised, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's about taking these three games at Celtic Park now and taking them, taking them seriously um, and playing good football. If we can get three, six points here and, and maybe do what we've done in Rome, who knows where we And this is the last through. season where you can come third yeah, and come to the Europa League, exactly. right? Exactly. So, Listen, if we could get into the Europa League, I'd be, I'd be happy with that. And you know what? I, I think I think we can do it. If we play like we did in the Open 45 last night and, and compete with these teams, we, we can do something. Great to get Ryan's thoughts there on everything Champions League related this season for Celtic, especially after last night's result out in De Kuyp. I don't think it was that bad of a result, considering they had two players sent off, 2-0 away to the Dutch champions. Not the worst start. You'd obviously expect to. You'd want a point. You'd want three points to start it off, obviously. And it does put the pressure on Celtic now winning their games here at home. But um, again, the model here at the club isn't to splash the cash on a lot of big name players and big signing players. They bought Jota. Uh, they sold Jota, obviously, for like 30 million euros or whatever. Um, but haven't really replaced him with a big name. Obviously, they bring players in and sell them on for a profit, which obviously works well they're in profit as a club because of that um, and other reasons well a massive club the merchandise they must sell the tickets they must the money they must get from tickets here week in week out um, as well as like selling players on and stuff um, but again what is the long-term plan how can Celtic finally start to compete in the Champions League and it isn't a foregone conclusion that they think they'll finish bottom of the group or third in the group or whatever um, when can we see the big clubs in Scotland finally competing on the biggest stage we saw it last season as well didn't we both finished bottom of the group Rangers had the worst ever um, record in the Champions League and um, I suppose the record is almost irrelevant you just want to not finish bottom which they both did last season will it happen again this season for Celtic Rangers obviously are in the Europa League so they've regressed technically from Europe last season from Champions League to Europa League this year um, Aberdeen are in the Conference League as well so guys let me know what you think in the comments below on how Celtic will do in the Champions League how Rangers will do in the Europa League and how Aberdeen will do in the Conference League do check out Ryan's channel as well Celtic fans he posts almost every day one of the most consistent YouTubers out there so go and show him some support um, and go and subscribe to his channel thank you so much for watching and goodbye